be seated. The Kingswood College vision statement reads, and I quote, to be recognized locally, nationally, internationally as an excellent Methodist school and as a transforming influence in society. In keeping with this vision, and in memory of an old Kingswoodian, Neil Agat, I welcome you to the annual Neil Agat Memorial Lecture, aptly named Standing Up Against Injustice. Our guest speaker, Advocate Madun Seller, College Head, Mr. Trafford, Governors, Heads, Representatives from Grahamstown Schools, Convocation from Rhodes University, Advocate Vessels from the, from the Public Protector's Office, Councillors, Fellow Councillors and their partners, Management and Staff, Partners, Visitors and Pupils of the College, a warm welcome to you on this special evening. Nam gele gile apa pagat gwe tu nam klanj. Kululani it yas kuse kaya nalap. I'm humbled and feeling very honored this evening to have been given the task of welcoming our guest speaker, advoca advocate Tulisile Nomkosi Madonsele, better known as Tuli or rather Mam Tuli. When our President Jacob Zuma appointed Advocate Madonsela as South Africa's public protector on the 5th of October 2009, he could not have predicted what he was getting. <laughs> Before Advocate Madonsela's appointment, the public protector was a low-key office that many South Africans were unaware of. Today, the first woman to hold the role is revered by many, as after just seven years in the post, she has positioned this office as one of the most high profile in the country. Madonsela likens her role as public protector to the vendor chief's paternal aunt, known as the Makadzi, a non-political figure who, according to Madonsela, and I quote, gives the people a voice while giving the traditional leader a conscience. At the time of her appointment, Advocate Marinsella was the only full-time commissioner in the South African Law Reform Commission. Before then, she held various leadership positions in civil society and the public sector. These include membership of the inaugural Commission for Employment Equity and the Steering Committee of the Legal Services Charter and various management positions in the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. She was one of the 11 technical experts that assisted the Constitutional Assembly in drafting our new constitution. As a child, she recalls a disagreement with her father, who wanted her to become a nurse. Going against his will, she went on to graduate with a BA Law and an LLB de degree. She forfeited a Harvard scholarship to focus on her cons constitution drafting role, contributing to the historical transition to democracy in this country. Advocate Marin Sela is the co-architect of the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, the Employment Equity Act, and Local Government Transition Act. She also contributed to laws such as the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, repeal of the Black Administra Administration Act, recognition of Customary Ma Marriages Act, and the reform of Customary Law and Related Ma Matters Act. She has played a central role in the drafting of various transformational policies and related instruments. She's also written extensively, published, and provided training on various aspects of the law, equality and human rights in general, her work includes co-authoring The Bench Book for Equality Courts, a resource book for equality court clerks, a legal advice handbook on family law and related matters, and handbooks on gender mainstreaming and leadership. She will release her new book once she retires from her current role. 
She was born in Johannesburg to a working class family in 1962. Advocate Madan Sela has also had extensive involvement in international human rights work, which has included the drafting of certain instruments, drafting of country reports, and participating in country delegations to various international conferences and related fora. Advocate Madan Sela was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine in 2014, and by New Africa magazine as one of the 100 most influential Africans. It is clear that her influence stretches from the world stage to the homes of ordinary South African citizens. Mam Tuli, you have led with such extraordinary courage, independence, wisdom, dignity, and grace. Softly spoken and seemingly unassuming, you have revealed a heart of steel. You have inspired us you make us proud to be South African. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Advocate Madan Sela to deliver the Neil Agate Memorial Lecture for 2016. <laughs> Program Director, Chairman, of Kingswood College Council, Mrs. Diana Hundley, the head teacher of Kingswood College, the leadership of the college, all of you honored guests. What an honor and privilege to speak to you this evening on such an important occasion. I apologize for the technicalities that have prevented the slides from showing. We are here to celebrate and to remember the life of a great young mind that taught us the value of standing up against injustice beyond the paradigm of just us. Many people do stand up when they see injustice, but usually it's when it affects them and when it affects people like them. For example, there is something today that we call Black Twitter. And when there's something that affects us, black people, and you are responsible for whatever has affected us, Black Twitter, will get you. But Dr. Neil Agat was a different kind of intellectual, a different kind of activist against injustice. He wasn't affected by racism. He was white, he was a medical doctor. In fact, when he died, he was just about the same age as my eldest child, which just shows that he lived a very short life, but a very impactful life. I think one of the greatest lessons we can learn from his life is the idea that justice is an extremely important concept. But sometimes we mistake justice for just us, where we do stand up against injustice, 
but only those injustices that affect us. Forgetting that even those injustices that do not immediately affect us do actually affect us because of the interconnectedness of humanity. I believe that ancient human beings were smarter than us when they conceived the concept of Ubuntu, I am because you are. They knew that you have to look after a stranger's welfare because ultimately your own survival as a human being and your own survival as a group is linked to the survival of other human beings. Hence in ancient Africa, when a stranger came, the last morsel of food that was available would be given to the stranger because it was understood that by preserving and protecting the life of that stranger, we were preserving and protecting our own lives. Somehow, Dr. Neil Eckert had that spirit in him. As a white person who wasn't born in this country, he was born in Kenya, his skin color bought him privileges. I know many people who would say, I came to this country or my parents came to this country without a cent in their pockets. And they were able, though, to accumulate their own property, their own businesses today. He could have easily got into, gotten himself into those trappings. And indeed, he came here. He studied here at, King, at Kingswood College. He passed well, he got a lot of merits. He was part of the student leadership. He had his own life ahead of him. He could have had a great career as a doctor, but he decided to join hands with those who were fighting against injustice. He joined the trade union movement and at some stage, he was working in the trade union movement without any assent, often having to work after hours in the casualty ward of hospitals to earn extra money to be able to find his work as a trade unionist. He was also able to use that very money to fund his colleagues to advance trading and work. And all of that was really about fighting the injustices he had seen. And the first time he was exposed to those injustices was when he was working in various townships, initially here in the Eastern Cape and later in Gauteng, in where the place we now refer to as Eguru Leni, that he was exposed to the abject poverty of black people, particularly those of African origin. And he realized that as a doctor, as a medical doctor, he could handle some of those problems, he could solve some of those problems. But a lot of the problems he encountered had something to do with entrenched injustices within the system of apartheid, which was a system of legalized injustice, a system of legalized discrimination, primarily on the grounds of race, but also in the grounds of race, but also on the grounds of gender, disability, and other forms of discrimination. The forces of evil can kill the messenger, but the message lives on. He was killed. The official verdict was that he hanged himself in 1982. 
at the age of about 29. We don't know whether he hanged himself or not, but the Truth Commission said, or rather the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that even if he had hanged himself, the conditions he had been placed under, the trauma that had been imposed on him during the period of his detention without trial was responsible for what eventually happened to him. And yes, he was killed, but the message he carried through the way he lived continues to live today. In fact, it was that message that in a very twisted way got me involved in the struggle. I had become conscientized about injustices during apartheid because, of course, during 1976, I was a teenager. Although I was studying in Swaziland, I would come home for holidays, and I remember coming in August and witnessing a lot of smoke, witnessing a lot of people running around, and a lot of memorial services taking place at Regina Mundi, which is in, in Soweto, very close to my home in Lamini. So I'd been exposed, but I had not formally joined any organization until the death of Neil Agate. In fact, I wasn't aware of that and uh, when I got the, invest the invitation. It was when I was planning this lecture that I realized that his life somehow crossed my path. When I was a, what was referred to as a student teacher, or that was those teachers who were not qualified in the 80s, this was 1982, and I was teaching at Naledi High as an unqualified teacher. A friend of mine went to the memorial service of Neil Agat and met an, another person who became our friend, or became her husband later, but became our friend at the time. His name was Ted Impesi. So if it wasn't for the funeral of Neil Eckert, would never have met Teddy Impesi. An eternal optimist who went around preaching the gospel of a new South Africa, an egalitarian South Africa that was going to be realized when apartheid fell. That egalitarian South Africa was a South Africa that is now forming part of the constitutional dream. It is accordingly for me an honor and privilege to stand here before you and reflect 22 years into democracy on what has been delivered because Neil Agat and people like him stood up against injustice with a paradigm that transcends just us. They paid the ultimate price to keep the South African dream alive. He decided that he was his neighbor's keeper. Now between me and you, why should you be your neighbor's keeper? Why should you be your neighbor's keeper? Have you ever pondered that question? Have you even pondered who is your neighbor? Well, Nilagat 
thought that he was his neighbor's keeper. And I believe that he thought so because as long as there is unhappiness everywhere, none of us can ever be happy. As long as there is injustice around us, sustainable peace is an illusion. If you look at where we are today, you see things burning. You see a lot of anger. Those are neighbors that are angry. Those are our neighbors. But I thought the best way of thinking about who is your neighbor is a poem that was written in the 60s by an American by the name of James Patrick Kinney. The name of the poem is called The Cold Within. To some people I've told this poem many times, but I would just want to summarize with us to make sense of why Neil Aggett did the things he did resulting in him losing his life at the tender age of 29. In this poem, written by a white male Christian at a time where there was legalized and entrenched racism in America, and where discrimination on the grounds of sex sexual orientation, and many other forms of discrimination were legalized or allowed. He wrote a poem where he talked about six persons trapped by happenstance. He says it was a cold, dark night, which meant fire was an extremely important resource for the group, both for the purposes of light and for the purposes of warmth. Among the six people, thank you so much. Among the six people, the first one looked around and had a piece of wood or a log in his hand and decided not to put it in the fire because sitting across him was somebody from a different church than his. Then there were five people that also had pieces of wood or logs in their hands. The second one looked around and saw across the room somebody from a different race and decided he did not want somebody from outside his race to benefit from his lock. The third one was a rich man who looked across and saw a poor man and he decided the lazy poor. Why must he benefit from my lock? And for that reason, he kept his lock. The poor man, not knowing that the rich man had withheld his lock on his account, saw the rich man across the room and decided, the filthy rich, why must he benefit from my lock? And decided to keep his. The fourth man looked around and decided that here in the room were many people from a historically advantaged position who had benefited all the time because of privileges accorded to them because of their skin color. He then decided he was not going to 
let them benefit from his piece of wood and withheld it. You had all of these people, the first one withholding it on the grounds of religion, the second one withholding it on the ground of race, the rich man withholding it because he doesn't want the poor to benefit, the poor withholding it because he doesn't want the rich to benefit. The black person not wanting the white people to benefit because they've always benefited. The last man was a mercenary who had never done anything but for gain and couldn't see anything he would benefit from these people who were on their deathbed. And he kept his lock. James Patrick Keeney, hence, he ends his poem with the following words. Their locks held tight in death's still hands was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. Somebody like Neil Eichert knew that even if you're not immediately affected by injustice, but if you allow injustice to be visited on your neighbor, eventually you too will go down because we are in the same boat. He knew that injustice creates anger. Injustice creates despair. And that eventually, those who are affected by injustice fight back. And when they fight back, rules don't matter. And eventually, none of us is safe. Now let's look at where we are, though. Neil Ankert was driven by a dream, the dream of his South Africa where everyone's humanity would be embraced. The dream of a South Africa where everyone's human potential would be freed and where there was going to be friendship and prosperity for everyone. Are we there yet? You'll agree with me that we've come a long way as we have been using the Constitution as a bridge to the South Africa we have chosen to become. The Constitution is a bridge in that it gives us a very clear vision of the society we want to become, one that is based on the rule of law, supremacy of the Constitution, equality of all, human dignity, and prosperity for all. It is a society that is supposed to be respected by other nations. Today, we have gained a relative amount of respect. 20 years into democracy, many people who didn't have homes have homes. Blatant discrimination or direct discrimination is now prohibited. You could never sit on a bench today where it says blacks only or whites only. Or go to a movie theater where it says blacks only, whites only. When Neil Argett was helping in the trade union movement, I remember those were the days some of us could not go to stay in a core or any of the other mainstream movie houses. In fact, I remember we could only go to some place in Mayfair in Jobek called Avalon. So all of those things have been removed from the South African landscape. Many of our people have been given homes and the quality of life has improved for many people. But has the quality of life improved for everyone? Has everyone's potential been freed? Unfortunately, no. There's still disparities 
primarily in areas of socioeconomic rights. Despite the Constitution promising everyone a freed potential and improved quality of life, promising everyone human dignity, the right to equality, and basic rights such as the right to food, water, access to health services, access to education, there's still disparities in that area. There's still people who don't go to school on some days. They call them no school days because there are no bridges, there are no roads. There's still young people who have never used the computer in their lives. When they go to university, it will be the first time they touch a computer. And obviously, they start at the level of disadvantage. There's young people who are studying in schools where they have to imagine what a laboratory looks like. They can see those things on the internet, but in real life they can't do, they can't conduct a chemistry experiment because there are no facilities. You'll also agree with me that though, as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. And I think this is something that Neil Aget knew. And I think that's something that young people today who have started the recent wave of social justice activism are also aware that as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. What are some of those injustices, apart from the ones I've referred to? At university, are you aware that there are children who go for days sometimes without any food? Because the best is that they have only cover school fees. They don't have books. They have to rely on others to help them with books, to borrow a book for a night. They don't have computers in this age where everything is on the internet, including knowing what assignment are you supposed to do for tomorrow. The university expects you to check it on the internet. Data, when they say that data must fall, Many of them don't have that data because just to be able to function on a day-to-day -day at a university, you've got to have access to the internet. But I was horrified two years ago when my daughter went to the University of Pretoria for the first time, moving from Varsity College, when she literally discovered young people sleeping in the bathroom in the library. Young people who were saying that I buy bread and I eat it for the whole week, just cutting a few slices per day and drinking it with water so that I may get an education. Young people who hang around the university for months because they can't afford the registration fee. They've passed, they've gotten a place at the university, but they don't have the financial means to move forward. Young people who have been allowed by the university to continue their education, but finances have dried out, and then they leave through financial exclusions. Many young people who are confronted with these things are horrified and they do something about it. Hence, we now have heard the fees must fall movement. I know with my daughter, she tried to shelter some of them at her own flat for a little while. She even brought one to live with us for a little while. But that's not a sustainable solution. But it's remarkable how resilient these young people are. Like the one who came and stayed with us for a little while had literally been staying in the bathroom. I asked her, how do you do it? 
how do you keep your head high? She said to me, Mama, going back home is not an option because the poverty back there is worse than sleeping in the toilet. But this is happening 22 years into democracy. This is happening when a 29-year-old died. He didn't have to do the work he was doing. But he did it anyway. Because he thought that his own happiness was linked to the happiness of fellow human beings. So as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. In fact, the United Nations has acknowledged that. As part of the Sustainable Development Goals, they've got goal number 17, which talks about social justice, peace, good governance, and various things in one package. As we speak, the whole world is looking at the day of international peace. We're celebrating peace. We're joining hands to improve peace in the world. But can we have peace whilst there's social injustice around us? In Zulu, we have a saying that says, Inlala ibanga ulak. It literally means poverty makes someone angry. Are we surprised that there are angry people around us? Are we surprised that anger leads to rage? And there's a fine line between rage and madness. I'm saying these things, dear colleagues, not because I'm saying it's okay for things to happen the way they're happening. I'm not saying that people should be unreasonable and destroy things. I'm saying to the rest of us, you've got to pause for a moment. As one young filmmaker is saying, there's a young filmmaker by the name of Garth who's made a movie called Beyond the River. He's a young white male too. And his movie is based on a movement that he's starting, which is called, What's Your Story? Before you judge the person seeking, sitting next to you for being irrational, find out what's their story. Because sometimes they just want to be heard. In fact, one of those young people that my daughter found at the University of Pretoria, his name is Jackson. He was sleeping in a bathroom. So they started a movement called I Am Jackson. Just because somebody noticed Jackson. Today, Jackson walks tall at the University of Pretoria and proudly says, I am Jackson. I used to sleep in the bathroom. But what he wanted to happen was somebody to acknowledge his humanity. Somebody to notice that there was something wrong with him sleeping in the bathroom. But somebody noticing that he was sleeping in the bathroom, because sometimes we don't even notice that somebody is sleeping in the bathroom, because we're all minding our own business. And this is what Neil Agat did differently. He was a doctor. He could have just focused on healing people. He took time to know them. He even stepped out of his comfort zone to learn Zulu so that he could converse with people and find out what's their story. And once he knew what their story was, he did something to end human suffering. 
Today, one of the things people are angry about are persisting inequalities marked by persisting racism and racial disparities, which are exacerbated by other social justice concerns. So there's racism in a context where there is already structural inequality expressing itself in racial tones. Poverty has a black face and poverty has a, has a female face. I'm not saying there aren't people who are poor who are white. And I'm not even saying that we, the answer is we, we need poor white people. I think the answer we just need to end poverty. And that's what the UN has committed us to. And what we need to do then is not to look the other way as Phil Collins tell us we do in one of his songs. Find out what's their story and do something about it. Today, women, particularly black women, continue to bear the brunt of structural patriarchy compounded by racism and class-based inequality. You will agree with me that working class women continue to bear the brunt of inequality. And that's why young ones came out with a slogan, outsourcing must fall. It was a struggle for grown-ups, but young ones picked it up because when they walk around these university corridors, they see these people. They talk to them. They find out what's your story. And they realize that many of them end between 1.5 thousand rand and 3.5 thousand rand. They realize that in our universities, whilst those who are academics have privileges of having your children study for free, the outsourced ones did not have those privileges of having their children study for free. Even they themselves could not study for free if they wanted to advance their own education. And it took people like Neil Eckert of today to find out what's happening around us, what are the continuing injustices, and they started to do something about it. What about children? People with disabilities, foreigners, LGBTIs, older persons, and other left behind groups. What are we doing about them? We're not all called upon to do what Dr. Neil Eckert did. We don't even have to die at the age of 29. But we can do something. And we shouldn't stop ourselves from doing something just because we're worried that it will be too little. Because it's little drops of water that create the mighty sea. So if one person does very little and the next one does very little, together we can achieve something. Right now when there's a crisis, think about crowdfunding. If all of us were to just put five rand, those who can afford five rand, I know that when we're talking about those who are really poor, they don't even have five rand. But if those who have a bit could put five rand, we could alleviate some of the social injustice. Because although the state is tardy in achieving social injustice, it can never do everything. So what locks of wood or what locks do we have in our hands today? And what fire should we keep going? I believe that the fire that we need to keep going is not the fire that is in my picture, which is something burning. 
but it is a fire that gives life. It is the flame of democracy that we all have a duty to keep going. I believe I'm here at your invitation, but also at the invitation of the young ones here at Kingswood College. That's their way of contributing to the flame of democracy, by just having a conversation, by just keeping the legacy of Neil Agate alive, you are contributing to the flame of democracy in two ways. The first one, you are contributing by making sure that we remember what he fought for and we're playing our part to complete that journey until we reach the South Africa he yearned for. But by keeping his legacy alive, as you are also reminding us that people like Neil Agate fought the system. In fact, those days it used to be called the system. They never fought people. It wasn't about white people or about black people or about this. It was the system. And the people who were fighting against the system were black and white. The people who were not fighting against the system were also black and white. Where some black people were perfectly happy with things as they were. Some of them even got into the homeland system and accumulated wealth in the process. And there were black and white people who chose the path of justice and some of them paid dearly, as Neil Aket did. What is the role of the intelligentsia today? People like him, they have to lead through the mind. And that has been my appeal to young people, particularly as I spoke to people at the Northwest University two days ago. My appeal was, yes, Young people are always the ones who change the world. Young people are always the ones who point out social injustices. But educated young people change the world through their minds. We speak about the wrongfulness of class inequality today because there was a person called class, uh, there was a person called Karl Marx. Before him, there was a person called Engels. Before that, there was a person called um, Hegel in, 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 in Kant. And all of those people looked at the world through fresh eyes and said, this can't be right. There has to be a better way. So my appeal to you young people who are the majority in this room, particularly those from King, Kingswood College, is use your minds to analyze society as it is. Use your minds to help us to conceive ideas on how can we make democracy work in this complex world. How do we make democracy participatory? But above everything else, how do we keep the constitutional dream alive? How do we fast track the delivery of social justice to all? In a capitalist society, there'll always be inequality, but gross inequality is unsustainable. Even the United Nations has said that this gross disparities between the rich and poor are the reason why the world is unstable today. So it is my duty, it is your duty, it is our duty to end poverty and inequality. It is our duty to find ways and means to help the state to play its part meaningfully in advancing social justice. And part of the state meaningfully is effective service delivery, which means ending maladministration. It includes eroding corruption, and ethical governance. On the question of ethical governance, ethical governance is not just about not stealing money. Ethical governance is about governing in a manner that ensures that 
we do the right things the right way. And what are the right things? They're not just about not stealing money. One of the right things we have to do as part of ethical governance is to embrace Section 237 of the Constitution. I honestly believe that if we had embraced Section 237 of the Constitution, we would not be having a fees crisis. Because Section 237 says that constitutional responsibilities should be given priority. That would, have been meant, that would have meant that in the last 22 years of democracy, funding for higher education would not have declined in real terms, as has happened. It would have increased as the number of students to be funded increased. But in addition to that, would have even put more resources to address the apartheid disparities, the gender disparities, and disability disparities. But will it help us to moan the darkness? No, it will not help us to moan the darkness. Our job now is to make sure that we work with government, we work with business, we work with every person who understands that we are our neighbor's keepers. Because if we don't look after our neighbors, we will not be able to enjoy peace. We will not be able to enjoy happiness. The Pub Protector South Africa is your partner in this regard. The Pub Protector is an institution created under Chapter 9 of the Constitution to become your partner in the promotion of good governance. Its role is to investigate any alleged or suspected improper conduct in state affairs, to report on that conduct and to take appropriate remedial action. But basically, as uh, the chairperson of Kingswood College Council said, the power protector gives people a voice and the state a conscience. When dialogue between the state and people has failed, it is one of the mechanisms to repair that dialogue. It's not the only mechanism. The Human Rights Commission is another avenue. A petitions program is another. The hashtag movement is another. The media in general. So we have all of these avenues. How can we help? We can help by making sure that if we see injustice, we stand up against injustice as he did. By petitioning government if we need to, by writing letters to government if we need to, by mobilizing against injustice if we need to, as we have seen those, for example, who, like Neil Eggett, helped workers against outsourcing or labor broking. Government is bound to drop the ball. But that can't be persistent or done with impunity. So part of our collective job is to make sure that we help government not to drop the ball, but when government drops the ball, we point out that the ball has been dropped and we assist in fixing the damage. Dear colleagues, we owe a debt of gratitude to Neil Aggett and to people like him. In Zulu we say, asisoze sabalibala. In other words, we'll never forget them. Ours is to keep the legacy alive by walking the talk on good governance ensuring accountable democracy and the rule of law. Everyone can stand up against injustice. You don't have to do big things. Through ordinary things, you can achieve extraordinary results, especially if we work together. All we need is to understand that we're in the same boat, 
And all we need is to understand that our fortunes are intertwined. I am because you are. That's Ubuntu. That's something that he understood. Thank God for his life. Thank God for his legacy. May the young ones among us learn lessons from his life, from his life and lead us to a better South Africa. Thank you. Advocate Madam Teller, my sincere thanks to you for your words, and I know Luto will say more in her vote of thanks to you shortly. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also very pleased to report that while in Frontier Country and in Grahamstown the roads may be potholed, I have learnt reliably this evening that the potholes of the internet and technology are not here in Grahamstown, but are in distant places away from this town. It's my privilege this evening to present to you the recipient of the Neil Agat Award. And I'd like to give you some background to this award before I read the citation. This award was presented to the college some years ago by the class of 1970. It was those young men who were with Neil Agat in the school at the time, and they matriculated him with him in that year. The purpose of the Neil Agat Award is to foster a spirit of individual spirit of service above self in young men and women of this college. It should pay tribute to the recipient's true commitment to the wider social responsibility within the college as well as within the greater community of Grahamstown in South Africa. The class of 1970 believes that Neil Agat's life should be considered a true life vacation and centered around the tireless calling to the community service for the betterment of society at large. For him, there was clearly no desire for capital accumulation, but rather his focus lay with the betterment of those lives he could personally serve. And we recognize this through a donation that was made by that group of Old Kings Williams. It is a sculpture by Maureen Quinn, which is to my left. And the statuette represents no specific race, religion, creed, or sex, but is clearly African. And it stands proud and tall, broad-shouldered and strong-legged, and is firmly committed to social justice in the face of the struggle to fight any human suffering and social injustice that exists within South Africa and the broader community. Its criteria are threefold. It talks first to community engagement, where the recipient demonstrates an understanding of the wider social environmental issues in this, our Grabstown community. They have shown a significant contribution to projects that are run by the school, most notably through the ICDB Trust. They are engaged in community, community engagement projects which are self-driven and of their own making. The second criteria is that shown human courage and they have displayed moral courage, integrity, and a willingness to stand up for what is right, even in difficult and trying circumstances. It may mean taking unpopular decisions and not being influenced by others. 
And lastly, it talks to you in what we've heard this evening about social justice. And that means a respect for all, a demonstration of inner courage to fight for human dignity and for those younger and less powerful than themselves. And that they have shown an active interest in social justice and human rights, both within the college and within the broader landscape of South Africa. So it is my privilege, as I said earlier, to read the citation for the Neil Agard Award of 2016. And I do need to say at the outset that this award is not always awarded annually. It's awarded when there is a recipient who we believe, as a college, fulfills the criteria I've set out already. The recipient of this year's award was a visible presence in the school from her first day in grade eight. Her liveliness, her musical and dramatic ability, and her courage to give a speech at the best speakers competition while in grade eight, her academic success, all of these marked Luta Zono as a girl who had much to give in this college. In late 2015, I had the pleasure of accompanying Luto to make a presentation to the board of the South Deep Trust in Johannesburg. There, she reflected on her journey through Kingswood and how this had influenced her worldview and how this had translated into what she could take back to her community. And so through that, in her community, she became a beacon of hope. Her willingness to embrace her education in the service of others was not on that day, in that boardroom, lost on her audience. And she too was given a standing ovation. And may I say, there was not a dry eye in the room. It is her willingness to give that has put her in line for this prestigious Neil Eggett Award. First, she has tirelessly served her school community in plays, music, competitions, as a chapel steward, and this year as head girl. She has served with fairness, kindness, integrity, and dignity. She stands up for what she and others believe in. She was the energy behind our Youth Day celebration last year, and she drives the celebrations around Heritage Day. She is involved in, inter in the Interact program, which by definition is a service club. She's been the chairperson of the Kingswood College Youth Committee and secretary to the Grahamstown Youth Committee. In this role, she led the Nelson Mandela Project to collect blankets for the needy. As part of the Interact group, she has adopted other girl two other girls whom she visits regularly. She has also been the organizer of the first term social fundraiser. Luther has shown that service in small things makes a very big difference in the lives of those who benefit. Since grade eight, she's been collecting old and wanted clothing, stationery, school shoes around the school and distributing these to families which she knows are in need. She is currently collecting sanitary wear and unwanted makeup for schoolgirls who cannot afford this. She has established strong ties with Mary Waters and made time to teach a group of girls netball. She and her mother also collect magazines that can be used in Extension 7 schools as material for projects as well as important leisure reading. She is happy to lend her dance dresses to those girls who cannot afford their own. Luto has, by example, shown what can be done to improve the lives of others if we are sensitive to the needs and purposes in making a difference. She is truly a worthy recipient of the Neil Agate Award for Courage and Service, and I'd like to invite Advocate Madan Seller to come forward and present this award to Luto.
I think your response <laughs> tells it all. Congratulations Thank once again you. to you, Luther. And I'm now going to ask Luther to make the vote of thanks. Wow, well, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, wow. Well, Advocate Madonsela, I speak on behalf of everyone here to say that we are so privileged to have you with us this evening. I'm sure that we've all taken so much from what you've shared with us, and we feel encouraged and motivated after your talk. You are an inspiration because you go beyond your role as public protector, which you carry with such grace and humility by exuding an inner confidence, which I'm sure we all aspire to. Fearless and resolute, courageous in the face of criticism in order to do what is right. These traits inspire us as young and old to become better human beings because of your leadership. So on behalf of Kingswood College, the staff, the parents and the pupils and our visitors, we'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us this evening. Thank you so much, advocates. Friends, we've come to the end of the evening, but before we leave tonight, would you join me as we have a moment of silence and then we conclude in prayer. Let us pray together. We take a moment to become aware of your presence here tonight, God. <clears throat> we turn our attention to you and remind ourselves of who you are. You are good, you are holy, set apart, you are love. You are above all things, you are creator God. <clears throat> so thank you for who you are, thank you for what you have done for us in Jesus and for what you continue to do through your Holy Spirit, particularly through lives surrendered to you, lives offered to be used by you so that others may know peace, healing and reconciliation with you and with each other. We know that throughout history, you have shown that you have a heart for the poor and the oppressed, that you desire mercy and grace and justice for all people. In a world where violence seems to rule, we commit, O oh God, to small random acts of peacemaking, where people are oppressed because they look, act, speak, think, or love differently, we will affirm their freedom where people are exploited because they lack the strength or resources to refuse, we will seek to create alternatives. Where people are controlled through threat and fear, we will offer safety and hope. Where people believe their violence and power give them the right and ability to act as they please, we will call them to account. Wherever violence is done to another, through physical force, manipulation of truth, or the subtle workings of power, we will opt out, we will speak out, and we will stand out in opposition through small random acts of peacemaking. We commit our beloved South Africa to you and her leaders in government, opposition parties, business, and community leaders. We pray for wisdom, integrity, and peace but we know that we can help answer these prayers by examining our own hearts and by catching your dream for our land. We can change the way we speak and the way we joke and reach out a hand to someone else, especially those different to us, believing that their greatest different to us is their greatest gift to us. Thank you, Father, for people like Neil Agat and Tuli Madonsela, who in different times in history have been courageous in standing up against injustice. It comes at a great cost, far beyond what many of us will ever understand. So tonight we remember Neil Agate and his legacy. His life and his example inspires us. We commit to Advocate Madonsela to you and ask that you would strengthen her and protect her. May you refresh her in body, mind, and spirit. We lift up her family to you and all those she loves. God, you have invited us 
to partner with you in proclaiming good news, in freeing the imprisoned, in restoring the broken, in uniting the divided, and you have given us the capacity in your spirit to be co-workers with you. Raise up for us, O God, leaders, men and women who, like Christ, are unafraid of challenge, unashamed of serving, and unattached to their own personal gain. Men and women who, like Christ, call to the best within us and then lead the way. And in our own small spheres, God, may we be the leaders we seek and be part of healing the world. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out tonight. We've had a remarkable evening. Thank you again, Advocate Mononcella. Your words and also your life are an inspiration to all of us. Friends, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand for the academic staff to process out, and then you are free to leave the sanctuary. We wish you great God bless and safe travels. Thank you so much. Please, would you stand? <laughs> So please join us. <laughs> Send it.